Hello, my name is Ben Joseph. I'm uh, welcoming you to the Judge Ben Show. This is a program on uh, community TV that used to be Channel 17 for the veterans like myself, but uh, now it's town meeting TV. So, in any event, this is a program in which I interview people about subjects that concern the uh, the legal justice system in Vermont. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while, and I'm delighted today to be doing something that really is so positive. Uh, my guests today are Harmony Bourgeois. I, I spent some time in France, so I'm still pronouncing okay. bourgeois like bourgeois. bourgeois. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, Court, Courtney Whittemore? Yes, Courtney Whittemore. Well, that's not French. We don't have to no. fool around with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. It. Yeah, got it. And today we're going to talk about um, the Restorative Justice Center programs. So, Harmony, we're going to start with you. And uh, what is the RJC? Um, thank you for having us. No, oh, it's my pleasure. So, um, we're an agency that offers an opportunity for meaningful dialogue, right? So, we're an alternative to the traditional criminal justice system, and we give opportunity for people to um, repair harm that they've caused. So the law kind of deals with the criminal aspect and the punishment part, and we're focusing on repairing harm in relationships. Very good. And do you have offices in both Franklin and Grand Isle, or just in Franklin? Um, we're, our main office is located in Franklin, but we serve both counties. Okay. All right. And is, uh, I'm hoping that one of the things that we'll accomplish here today will encourage people to use, make these programs available in other counties. Mm -hmm. Is that happening at all? It is. So every county in Vermont has a CJC or an RJC, mm -hmm. mostly every county. Okay. And the list of programs that are offered by the Franklin Grand Isle Restorative Justice Center, mm -hmm. Uh, you've got yours there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is just, if you could just name them and we'll, we'll start there. Yeah, so um, you want me to just go through all the services yeah. and then we can kind of talk about them individually? So yep. we do a program called Pretrial Services. Mm -hmm. We deal with adult court diversion. Wow. We have a Tamarack program. We do, we have a whole youth services department. Mm. Uh, we have a special victim coordinator and we we are victim-centered, so we have victim services. Uh, we do a driving with license suspended program, mm -hmm. a reparative or restorative panel process. Mm -hmm. um, we also do a re-entry program that Courtney will talk more about later, but okay. in that program we have transitional housing, a community vocational services to help with employment, community housing services, and we do COSA, which stands for Circles of Support and Accountability. Wow. Busy. Busy. So how many people work uh, in your various programs, you know? Um, so total staff is 10, including myself. And you are one busy person. Uh, I'm pretty busy. Boy, when I try to call you on the phone, I just, I, I get a cup of coffee, and I get a comfortable chair, and then I'm going to wait, yeah. you know? <laughs> I do my best. You do. You do. It's remarkable what you do. Thank you. Okay. And how long have you been with the uh, RJC? So I believe it'll be my sixth year tomorrow, actually. Wow. So. Wow. Yep. Happy anniversary. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Happy anniversary, <laughs> in, indeed. And <clears throat> you, so you supervise nine other people? Yes. Nine other people. Wow. And who decides if a person should be referred to the RJC? So that will, that will vary based on what program we're talking about. Our okay. referrals can come from state's attorneys, uh, probation and parole, the judge himself can order, um, people can self-refer, so it really depends on what program we're talking about. Okay, and um, does that person have to be charged with a criminal offense in order to be referred to your program? The majority are in the criminal justice system, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be, but the majority of people we work with, yes, are within the criminal justice system. Okay. And um, is RJC used as an alternative to court-ordered probation? So it can be a condition of their probation, but mm -hmm. it's an alternative process. So we're focusing on um, repairing harm in relationships versus kind of like 
imposing a punishment. Yeah. Well, you know, I just got to tell you this. It's, I, I had a problem with a garage door in my house. So I call overhead door in Burlington. I'm out in North Hero. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, the guy will be there, you know, in the morning. So the morning comes, and I go out to the garage, and this guy's up on the ladder working. So I'm holding the ladder for him. And he looks down at me and says, hey, you're Judge Joseph. I said, yes. And I thought, uh-oh, you know. <laughs> You put me in jail. I said, no uh -oh. kidding. Oh, yeah, the first time you met me, you put me on probation. And then the second time you met me, I'd done something really nasty, mm -hmm. translate crime of violence. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's enough. I'm going to give you nine months to serve. And uh, I want you to uh, straighten up. Let's get it done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then he says to me, Judge, I got out eight years ago. And since that time, I've worked every day. I'm married. I have a four-year-old kid, mm. and he looks me right in the eye, and he says, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it can work. But um, often um, incarceration is, uh, is not so sanguine. You know, it can be difficult. It can be traumatic. And, pardon? It can be traumatic. Oh, amen. Yeah. Amen. What is the adult diversion services? So court diversion is um, a restorative process that um, individuals can come through with, generally they have minor minor charges. We can deal with driving license suspended, retail theft, mm -hmm. things of those, those um, in that nature. Mm -hmm. And they will come to us and go through a restorative process um, and essentially create a contract to repair harm caused. That might be various things from, you know, reflections, apologies, restitution if that's owed. Um, and once they, if they successfully complete, which is the goal, uh, they have the opportunity to have their charge then dismissed. Wow. Well, that, that should provide real incentive. Yeah. What's Tamarack? Tamarack is similar to court diversion, but it deals with individuals who may need support around mental health or substance use. So a lot of the times it's um, referred to us when the state's attorney or maybe the individual's attorney feels that the underlying cause of the crime might be due to mental health or substance use reasons. So we would connect them to supports and help them through a restorative process as well to make amends. And do you kind of follow them along so you know whether they're doing, a, oh, yes. doing the right thing? Yes. Wow. We would get releases to speak to any counselors um, and stay connected through that process to make sure they're getting the support they need. Um, and again, we would create a contract with them as well, too, to, to repair any harm that was caused by the crime. Wow. And uh, I'm just going through this list and yeah. this thing you gave me here. <laughs> youth services, what's that? Um, so we have a few different programs within the youth services. We would do a, a restorative process for all of them, really. Uh, they also have court diversion mm -hmm. um, for ages 10 to 21, I believe. Um, and we also have the BARGE program, which stands for Balanced and Restorative Justice. And that's similar to a reparative panel where kids may be involved already in the, in the system. And, wow. Yeah. And now going down the list, victim services, what's that? <laughs> so we have a dedicated victim coordinator. We are lucky in that aspect, and we are really victim-centered in our office. So our victim coordinator is reaching out almost in every program here, with the exception of reentry, which Courtney will talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, but our victim coordinator will reach out to any victims involved in these crimes um, and ask them if they like to participate in the process. So they always have a voice, um, and their voice may be, no, I don't want to participate, and that's okay too. Of course, it's up to them. Um, do most people want to participate, or are they um, not inclined? I wouldn't say most, but a lot. It's a, a substantial number, as we would say? I would say a substantial number, okay. which is really, um, to me, makes a big difference in the restorative process. Um, for people to be able to face the individual, maybe in some cases, or have to hear what that person says about how it's really affected them, which the court system doesn't a lot of times give that opportunity, so. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. And people charged with driving with license suspended. 
So we have a great driving license suspended program. Uh, people can come to our office. Alicia is fantastic. She helps people. Um, she has contacts at the Vermont, um, the DMV, sorry, and she will help people with reduce fines and get their license reinstated immediately so they can drive. They have to be under a contract and of course all those things, but yeah. Uh, I mean a license in Vermont as probably anyone knows is super important to have to mm -hmm. be able to get oh, amen. anywhere. I, I live in North Hero. Yeah. I, mean, you know, <laughs> I, I get it. Yep. And finally, what, are, what, what do you do with restorative panels? Restorative panels really are for, for um, referrals come, can come from a judge, they can come from a state's attorney, they can come from um, probation and parole, and those are for individuals who are not only charged with the crime, but they've, they've been convicted of the crime. Um, so it may be a condition of their probation, for example, to come to us to have a restorative panel. And a restorative panel is really, again, just about um, meaningful dialogue, creating an opportunity to repair harm caused by the crime. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm constantly thinking of what well, restorative justice is, is, is probation with a heart. <laughs> I mean, you know, really, that you're trying to help these people and not just threaten them with incarceration. Well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And in the law, of course, it's, you know, the law has, the law is the law, whereas I feel like, you know, what we're trying to do is really, really focus on I want to say the emotional aspect, but it's really about relationships and 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 emotionally dealing with those things. That you know, people we're all human beings, so we all make mistakes, and we all need to talk about that in order to move on. In my opinion. No, I understand. I understand. I'm going to give you a rest, uh, yeah. Courtney. <laughs> my turn. Your turn, kid. <laughs> and you've got several things that you're responsible for in, in the R. RJC, uh, transi tra Transitional Housing, is yes. that right? So I'm the Director of Reentry Services. So Transitional Housing um, is one of the programs that we have where we have um, 10 individuals that we can house in our program that are coming out of incarceration and are transitioning into the community. Um, and our Transitional Housing Program works with the individuals to connect them with services, to support them with whatever their needs are, um, and just to help them get back on their feet and hopefully successfully graduate from our program into their own independent living situation. So it's kind of like stepping down back into the community, getting your feet underneath you, and then moving forward um, towards independence. Um. What kind of caseloads do you have? So, so for the transitional housing program specifically, we have 10 beds there. So that's pretty kind of uh, a fixed number. But we also have two other programs that we work with, which is the, our community vocational services mm -hmm. and our community housing services. So we have two staff members that are able to go out into the community and work with individuals who either are currently under supervision or have a history, because mm -hmm. we open that up a little bit so that we can serve more individuals. And those two individuals can help people find employment, link with um, different service providers in the community, and hopefully also help them find housing. Because housing, mm. as most of us know right now, is incredibly difficult to navigate and hard to find. Um, and housing first models have shown that if someone has a safe place to live, then they have a better chance of being really pro-social and successful in the community. So those caseloads, each of our staff member can carry 30 individuals, we try to cap it at 30. I don't want to go much higher than that. It's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah I understand. <laughs> so we try to cap it at about 30 uh, for community-based individuals that we serve in, in each of those programs. It's just stunning to me that all this work is being done because uh, it was, obviously this is not something that the probation staff could handle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, this is, uh, and because it's not focused on incarceration, but rather success outside of incarceration, people are more inclined, I think, to participate. Mm. Well, Is that the, true? Well, probation officers have a lot on their plates already. Their caseloads are enormous. And one of the amazing things about our organization is how closely we're able to work with probation and parole. They send us referrals for people on their caseload where they're like, this individual, we recognize this individual needs some extra support. Can you guys work with them? So we often get wow. referrals from POs that are noticing that the people they are supervising need extra help, and then they come to us, and we can do the same. We have open communication with, um, there are grant funders, the Department of Corrections, so we have very open communication with probation and parole, 
and really value them as, as partners in the work that we do. Interesting, yeah. interesting. And um, what's COSA? Yeah, COSA. COSA mm -hmm. is the Circle of Support and Accountability. Um, and this is a, a program. I can see why you'd rather use the initials. I know, yeah. right? Shorter, <laughs> snappier. <laughs> Um, so this is a program where we have um, a staff member and they are working with um, what they call the core member. So this is an individual that typically is someone who's coming out of jail recently and they pair that core member with three um, community members, volunteers. Wow. And what they do is, is that for one year they meet uh, every week for an hour and they create a community just a small community around this core member who talks about the things they're struggling with, talks about their successes, kind of creates an amazing connection um, and a pro-social support system for that one kind of person very specifically so that they can feel supported in their time um, after coming out of incarceration. Wow. Yeah, it's a great program. We've seen amazing results from individuals that are really committed to, to going through the process. And the people who are participating in, in this, are they they're volunteers usually? or So the whole process is voluntary, right? So the core member, they can choose if they want to join and have this support. So they're also, you know, voluntarily doing the process. And then the three people that are on their team are solely uh, volunteers from our community that have indicated that they want to help other people in this way. So our volunteers in our whole agency, not just for COSA, but our whole agency volunteers are so incredibly important for the work that we do. We couldn't literally do our work without them. And the taxpayers aren't paying the cost. I'm sure there's that too. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah? I mean, gosh. Um, I know I've, I've, I've bugged both of you about um, recidivism, <laughs> and I understand that it's difficult to, uh, to generalize about this, but I gather that there is some indication that there's the people who complete these programs or participate in them are less likely to reoffend. Is that true? That's the goal, and I would say that that's true. I don't have a specific number for um, you today, but I, uh -huh. that is most definitely the goal. Yes. Mm -hmm. and I think in a lot of the work that we do, while numbers are important in terms of like getting, you know, getting that exact number of who's better, how much better, and there are those numbers out there. I think the way that we view success is a little differently in terms of we view success as the connections and the relationships that we've built within our different programs. Having individuals come back to us and, and voice how helpful our work was and, and the support that they felt in our program and what they're doing with their lives now, mm -hmm. that is kind of a real telltale for us of the success and the difference that we're making within our community. So the stories are kind of, they're the ones that feel, that, that give you the feels that what you're doing actually is making, making a difference. Well, um that too much? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm just so impressed. I just think it's great. I mean, I, I started a long time ago in a much different place. Uh, West Philadelphia is not the sanguine place that Vermont is, and uh, it was a tough, tough scene. I suspect it still is. Um, well, what, I'm, what I want to stress is I think that this is beneficial, and uh, from um, my days at the Wharton School, it's cost effective. I, I, I think mm -hmm. really for what, what goes on here, it's, it's really so important. Um, what could you just, we were going to have another person here today who couldn't make it to talk about your pretrial services. Yeah. Uh, could you describe what you do for pretrial services? Sure. So pretrial services um, is usually a referral made by uh, the judge. Mm -hmm. The state's attorney can request uh, it as well or a person can self-refer and what that is is they're asking for help to get connected to supports um, throughout the pretrial the entire pretrial period um, people may need help with a variety of things in particular mental health and substance use um, but you know we help in all facets driver's license there, there could be a variety of things that people need and we would help them throughout their entire pretrial period um, and, and we are uh, report back to the attorneys and the courts. Things are confidential, but if people are needing the support and wanting it, um, it it's really beneficial to the individu individual. And do you help people, well, just, just for example, do you help people get 
get their driver's license back? Absolutely. That yes. kind of thing? Yep. Well, that, you know, in Vermont, that's so important. It really I mean, is. How can, how, can you, how can you have a job without a driver's yep. license? Yep. The amazing thing about our organization is if someone comes through the door for pretrial services, right, and they identify all these different needs, we can do internal referrals mm -hmm. within our own agency, so it kind of becomes wow. like a one-stop shop. Wow. They can go and we'll get help with their license through Alicia, through the DLS program. They can get help with finding employment with Becca for our employment services or housing with Michelle. So we're able to kind of help address whatever the barriers or the needs are for the individual that comes through. And if and we can't do it, we have amazing community partners who can. Well, and, and these are the kinds of things that the, uh, the defense attorney can't do or it's very unlikely to provide, is that right? Time. It's yeah. time, right. So, so their defense attorney is really there to focus on their specific charge and the legal system. And the defense. Um, a lot of times, again, I'll just say, mm -hmm. individuals are a lot of times in the criminal justice system because of all these various other barriers that are, that are a hindrance, really. So if we can address other things that are needed besides the specific, focusing on the specific crime, um, you're going to make a huge difference. Oh, I, I, well, you know, I'm, just, I'm just so sorry I didn't have this available to me yeah. um, earlier on in my career. This is really great stuff. Well, um, <clears throat> just just to get back to the caseloads, how many? What are the caseloads in your in your program? We're pretty much topped out on our caseloads, which is great. Um, great for staff, but not great that we have that much need. But so we do have um, um, my staff, uh, Becca, who does our employment services. She can go up to thirty. Uh, so she has, wow. you know, a, she can have a good sized caseload. And then Michelle, uh, who does our housing also can have um, a caseload of 30 in the community. And you have a need for, for more service providers? Sure. Well, I, I, didn't, yeah. I, I didn't mean to be, <laughs> to sound preposterous, but no. uh, yeah. I mean, I think, the, I think that the need is there, and I think with any kind of service, we want to do more. I think we always want to do more. Um, it, we're just kind of, we can do what we have the time for at this point. Um, but we're always willing and super interested to learn different ways that we can introduce restorative justice into other areas in our community and what that could look like. So I think we're always interested in, in taking on more as long as we can balance that you know, safely within it's, our organization. Well, I used to hear people talk about money talks. Um, uh -huh. So uh, where do you get your money? So we are strictly grant funded. Mm -hmm. uh, we have... Um, grant from the Attorney General's Office, the AGO. We have a grant from DOC, the Department of Corrections, and we have a grant from DCF uh, for our youth department. Uh, those are base level grants. We also do get some town appropriations if we go to you know, select board meetings, um, explain what we do. Some towns are willing to put in their voter budget a little bit of money for us, and of course donations. Um, but yeah, it's difficult. It can be difficult, right? As Courtney was mentioning, we get um, overwhelmed sometimes with cases and, and it's hard to kind of put a cap on that because we want to help. Um, we know we're making a difference. We want to keep doing it. Um, but we are limited, I hate to say, by money, but that's the reality sometimes is, you know, we have a staff and, and you can't overwork your staff either to the mm -hmm. point of, you know, so yeah. But you you know you're saving the community a lot of money. It, it does save the community a lot of money. Um, if you look at what it costs to go through the court system or what it costs to incarcerate an individual versus um, our programs, it's it's astronomical savings. Wow, well, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. That's pretty no, really, that's really yeah. important. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, <laughs> So how do you judge the success rate of your individual programs? Do you have some method that you use or you just plug away? Um, a lot of times we just plug away. Of course, we have our reporting and our data that goes to our grant funders. Mm -hmm. um, I will say diversion, court diversion, um, for example, is about an 85 to 90 percent uh, success rate. So, um, you know, it varies, though. It's hard to kind of nail that down specifically to, as Courtney mentioned, success to us might mean something totally different than the data, mm -hmm. so. 
<laughs> you know, people come a long way, and, yeah. and yep. You want to comment on that? Sure. I mean, I think that, as I mentioned earlier, the success rate is based on the stories, um, and I think that when we have individuals who have come into our program, have just left incarceration, they create relationships with us, they stay with us for a year or longer, um, and then we get invited to their weddings. That oh. has happened. So um, we have these amazing opportunities to create relationships with people, and I think our successes is based in that, not necessarily the data, but the data is the data's good too. Mm -hmm. That's well, I, no, I think that, that the that the friendships are really important. Mm -hmm. It sounds kind of, and it's not profound, but a lot of these people are on their own, particularly now. God knows. Well, I will just say that's that's the point exactly, right? So when people in are, when people are in isolation or alone, they cannot change. I mean, they're not going to make effective change in their life if they're mm -hmm. isolated. If you can offer community and support, that's mm -hmm. when you're really going to going to see the success. Well, that, that certainly has not been uh, characteristic of probation supervision. It's difficult, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. they are focused on, yeah. Well, I just think with the probation supervision is they want them to do better, but it's always with the thought in mind that if you don't, I'll put you in jail. And that kind of kills the relationship. Yeah, I mean, they have a certain job that they have to do, right, mm -hmm. and a certain capacity that they can do it, do it in, and that's why they partner so great with us mm -hmm. because we're we're on that other spectrum that can focus on different things maybe than they can focus on or have the bandwidth to focus on. And I think with the Justice Reinvestment Act that has come through, I mean, they're looking at different interventions that they can use that isn't the end result being just go to jail. They, they recognize that sending somebody back to jail doesn't create any kind of lasting change. And in fact, sometimes it just creates more harm. Oh, please, um, absolutely. <laughs> so it's, it's amazing to see the Department of Corrections looking at different interventions, different partners, and different ways to kind of meet the needs of the people that they're supervising. So it's been really amazing to see kind of that shift be happening and we're super happy to be a part of it um, and to partner with people who are, who are interested in looking at it in that way. Well, I'm, I'm getting the five minute sign flashed at me. So I wanted to say, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, just again, we are community um, involved. We encourage volunteers. If anyone's interested in volunteering, they can reach out to the Justice Center, uh, Franklin Grinnell Restorative Justice Center. If you're interested in any of the programs we mentioned, we welcome we welcome it. Is there a phone number you would? Sure, 802-524-7006. Uh -huh. 7006, okay. Okay, so if you want to, if someone's out there and wants more information or is interested in this Absolutely. for a friend or someone in the family, 802-524-7006. Okay. And any closing thoughts? No, we just thank you thank and appreciate you for having us. Yeah, we yeah. appreciate oh, the opportunity. Well, well, I appreciate what you're doing. I think it's, it's been a long time coming, and I think it's going to make a big, big difference in how the system operates. Thank you all for watching. I'm going to try to have this thing distributed through the various uh, town meeting TV or the equivalent throughout the state because I think this is something that could be uh, used universally. So long. Thanks again.